And by doing this, uh, another very small thing I need to do, which is actually something that will uh, go away. Uh, enable. Never remember the name of that property. Sorry. Yes, enable mo model validation equal true. Uh, this will not be needed by the time we ship. Okay, so let's try to do the same thing, and again, setting reorder level to 17, and now we have this validator firing up. So, of course, right now it doesn't look super pretty, but it's using standard ASP.NET validator architecture, which means you could put a validation summary control in there, it would show in that, in that area, it would show along with potentially other validation errors. I mean, it, it fits in the standard ASP.NET validation architecture. Now, um, going back to the page, so early on we had uh, changed the get product method to uh, filter the product some more. But what if you don't want to do the filtering from the inside, but you want to pass in a parameter? So we were filtering by reorder level. Now let's see what it would be like to write a second get product method, which we'll call get products filtered. And here we'll pass, uh, let's just call it main, which is the minimum reorder level that we want to allow. So that in order to write this, we would, uh, the best way to do it is to actually use the one that returns everything and to say return get products dot where, and we just tell it to only show things where the reorder level is greater than min. And actually, to make it slightly better, instead of just making it an integer, we'll make it an optional integer to allow for the null case where we don't want this filtering to happen. And we'll add a little check that says if min is null, then we'll just return all of them. OK? So now that we have that, of course, this method that takes a parameter is not going to magically get called. You have to have UI that can get this parameter and connect the whole thing together. So let's take a look at how this is done. And it's all using pretty standard uh, ASP.NET technique, web forms technique, where let's first put together some simple UI. Yeah, just a text box. ID. Let's call it uh, filter. And let's also add oops, a button so we can submit. OK, so that's just the UI. It's not hooked up. But after we do. Uh, let's first change the name of the method, of course. We want to call this get products filtered. And in here, we have this concept of select parameters. And now we use a very standard control parameter telling it to get its value from uh, the filter text box, which we just called filter. Fresh behavior, yes. Oh, yes, small thing I forgot. I need to tell it the name of the parameter, which was min. This refers to the name uh, of the parameter in the method we created. So initially, reorder level is non filtered. And if I enter a number like 10, I look at this reorder column, and we get this. So again, this is a case where the behavior is very much driven by your domain service. You're keeping all your logic in there, and the page is just referring to that without having to hard code any logic you wouldn't want to have in the page. So 
another very interesting concept we're introducing with this data source, and which actually will be available with, for other data sources as well, is something we call the query extender. So the query extender is doing better than me. <laughs> Thank you. So this query extender, I guess I was fishing for that. This is a control that lives alongside the data source and that applies additional filtering to it. So we just give it target control ID means, yeah, this is the data source you're going to work with, domain DS. And in here, we can have one or more filters. So what are filters? They can be essentially things that produce arbitrary link expression that get composed with whatever the domain service returns. So one of the things that we support is search expression. And a search expression, first we need to tell it what kind of search we want to do, meaning contains, ends, or start with. Let's do a contain. And we'll tell it that it should work on the product name column. And now let's add some UI for that. And let's not get fancy. We'll just put another text box to get the search value. And in here, I can just do, again, very standard stuff, control parameter, control ID equals search. So now, yeah, sorry for the bad UI, the, the second text box is the one we just added for search. So let's do some random search string, and here we are. So to talk a little bit about exactly what happened there. Oh. <laughs> it's too much, isn't it? So really what's very, very interesting here is that we have a method which returns an iQuibble of product. And in this method, it can use link to do some arbitrary filtering, potentially based on the parameter that's passed in. And then it returns that to the domain data source. But in there, the power of link lets us apply additional composition to the link query. And in this case, it's applying something that's going to look like and where the uh, product name uh, includes whatever that string was. And the whole thing ends up being built into a single link query. So it's not like we're doing any kind of client-side filtering here. It's both the filtering that we do inside the domain service and on the outside ends up as a single optimized uh, link query, which basically ends up as a, a SQL query. So that concludes the uh, first demo, which where I specifically stayed away from showing anything related to dynamic data to really make the point that this domain data source is not a dynamic data thing. Now let's talk about dynamic data. So uh, since a number of you have not seen it, I'll give sort of a quick introduction about what it is. And it's basically a way to get you started with data-driven web applications very quickly. 